If you get a chance, check out our Energy Talks podcast from early November with Tony Siba, the futurist from Stanford, who put out a new report arguing that by 2030, the combination of wind, solar, and battery storage will bring down the cost of electricity so low that it will restructure both the economy and society in the same way that the combination of the internal combustion engine and cheap petroleum did beginning in the 1920s. Now the project we're gonna talk about today in this interview uh, is kind of like a little example of what Siba was talking about. It's using solar to power greenhouses that'll grow produce in the far north where, you know, uh, vegetables and, and fruit and vegetables are very expensive and hard to get. So we're gonna to talk to uh, uh, Her uh, Henry Penn from the University of Calgary and welcome to the interview, Henry. Thank you very much and uh, thanks for having me today. Why don't we start with an overview of this project, please? Sure. So the project has installed a uh, containerized hydroponic food production system at the Kwani Lake Research Station, which is in Southwest Yukon, uh, with the purpose of uh, understanding and evaluating both the practical applications in terms of what can be grown and how you do it, and then secondly, the uh, economical, social and environmental concerns that go along with these systems and, and helping to provide as much information as possible to other northern communities that would want to uh, install one of these systems or use one of these systems. Now, I'm a northern boy. I grew up in northern Manitoba, north of the 58, I think. Uh, so I, I understand what a northern winter is like, uh, very cold and uh, long and short days. So uh, how does the solar technology, how does it work during wintertime? Yeah, so the, the solar technology is paired with a battery storage system and a, and a power management system. And then we're also connected to the existing 20 kilowatt diesel generator that is at the Kalani Lake Research Station. And so the purposes of connecting all three systems is to essentially uh, create efficiencies in the system. So when there's lots of solar, we use solar. When there's minimal solar, but we've charged up the batteries, we use batteries. And then for the periods of the year where there's uh, insufficient solar, we can rely on, on diesel, but augmented with battery storage. Okay, gotcha. And what does that do to the economics? Because I'm, I'm assuming you've done some preliminary crunching of the numbers and compared what you think a tomato will cost out of your greenhouse as compared to what it would cost to, to ship it up? We, we've done, we have done some preliminary numbers. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the calculations that go into how much it will cost to grow also have to take into account how much you can sell it for and therefore what the market interest in that product is. Um, and so we haven't done too much work on that yet because one of the major parts of this project is, is community led and community driven in the sense that the, the communities and, and the people around the research station will have a direct input on what we grow in the container. Um, in terms of how much the solar is gonna contribute, for nine to 10 months of the year, there will be zero diesel signature um, on, on this, co this containerized uh, food production system. Um, so that will obviously greatly reduce the cost of, of those produce. Okay, I, I noticed as a researcher, you didn't let me uh, nail you down on this one. Fair enough, you need to get the project up and running so that you can actually have real data to do your calculations. Um, but let's talk about, let's assume for a second that it is economic and, and it seems to me that every project like this that I, uh, and I don't mean just uh, greenhouses in the North, I mean new technologies that are being you know, tested and adapted is you always start out at the, the high point of the cost curve, and then as the technology gets better, and as you learn, and learning is a key part of bringing down costs, then the cost curve bends down and you get to the point where it's, it's cheaper than, is, is that kind of the process you expect here? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, as you said, this is a research project. Um, and so we have funding for, for multiple years with this container uh, and with this system which will enable us to, to try lots of different experimental ways of operating it. We can try different business models, we can try different produce, uh, we can leverage existing um, containers and hydroponic systems across Canada and, and northern parts of the world, uh, and really combine all that together to create uh, a model, a, a handbook even, for, for how these systems can be used in the north uh, and how they can be used particularly in smaller 
um, smaller population locations. So we're not a big city. We're not, you know, a southern city. Um, we're, a, we're, we're in a northern environment with, you know, three to 5,000 people um, around us. That's very interesting. And I want to ask you why you chose solar instead of wind. It seems to me that wind would be available uh, in the north, uh, you know, 12 months of the year. Uh, so why did you choose solar? Um, we chose solar um, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, firstly, the per kilowatt value on it is, is lower than, than wind um, for, for at least our area. Um, secondly, the solar potential in our area exceeds the wind potential um, in, in our area. Um, and I think having the, the, the containerized system, the, high, the food production system doesn't have too many um, peak loads in it. The, the lights are on for, for anywhere from eight to 14 hours a day, depending on what we're growing. And then they're off. And, and there's a few other sort of cyclical processes in there, but we don't have that sort of peak demand um, that I think is typically e maybe easily addressed with, with wind when you have these sort of you know, large draws and, and large demands. Um, and so the solar battery generator combination really provides us with sort of a stable local grid uh, to be able to effectively and efficiently manage one of these production systems. Could we look forward to some time in the future, Henry, where let's say a community of 5,000, uh, probably that far north, it gets all of its electricity from diesel and the federal government has identified uh, getting rid of diesel power generation in the north as a Part of its climate policies. Could you see where, uh, you know, you might put in a combination of wind and solar so that that community not only does the greenhouse, but also is able to eliminate diesel for other power generation, uh, you know, for heating homes and powering homes? Is that, is, are you looking that far ahead? Um, we are. I mean, certainly we are from the Quantum Lake Research Station's perspective as well. Uh, trying to bring as many different systems online as possible to to reduce our overall diesel consumption as, as an operation, not just this project specifically, but the broad operation of the research station. Um, I think in terms of communities in the north, I, I, from my personal perspective is that there isn't a silver a bullet. There isn't a silver bullet here. The, you, you have to have a mixture. You have to have some solar. You have to have some wind. Um, you have to have maybe some geothermal. Uh, what, whatever is available in the area around the community, it, that's what you've got to use and that's what should be used in sort of concert with other things. Um, I do think that there is always going to be a need for diesel. Uh, you know, when, when, the, when the chips are down at negative 40, you know, and it's dark, the easiest thing to get power is still a diesel generator. And, and I don't think that's going away in the immediate future. Obviously, as battery technology and things like that increases, that's kind of the route we want to go. Um, but for the time being, that break glass case scenario is, is still a diesel generator. Um, and so the technologies that are addressing those emergency pieces are really where I think the key work is needing to be done from, from a northern perspective. Yeah, I remember those winters where two or three months of 40 or 50 below. Uh, yeah, you don't want anything breaking. You, you've got to have that power when you need it. Now, um, you must be excited about the prospect during the 2020s. This is what my experts have been told me in many interviews, is that the cost of wind and solar and batteries, we're still looking at significant cost reductions and, and, and increasing efficiencies. And that would only argue for this particular project to be more economic, more effective by 2025 or 2030. Yeah, I think you're right. And, I, and I, I think the argument is there to be made. I, I think, you know, even even with the higher capital costs of bringing in solar and battery technologies, when we uh, when we compare that to the to the cost of bringing food in this particular instance from even even just southern Canada, let alone, you know, southern US or, or down into South America, um, being able to grow locally sustainably um, has to be better, not just from a cost perspective, but from an environmental and social perspective. Um, and, and as the costs the costs are only coming down, I think, is, is where we're going with this. And, uh, and I hope that that demonstrates more and more of a need for this type of technology. Henry, thank you very much. Good luck with the project. We'll follow thank this with, uh, with interest uh, in the future. And hopefully we'll have you on in uh, another year or two or three to talk about what a great success it was. Wonderful. And thank you very much for today. I appreciate it.